Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cantor David Berger. I'm the Cantor at KAM Isaiah Israel Congregation in Chicago. And uh, I've been a proud part of the Zamir Choral Foundation for uh, I think my entire adult life, <laughs> I would say. Uh, when I first joined uh, Zamir Chorale back in 2001, uh, and sang with the choir for a number of years and have continued to be an active uh, faculty member every year at the North American Jewish Choral Festival. I'm honored to host this, our fourth in our series of conversations about music in challenging times presented by the Zamir Choral Foundation. And I know that we're all friends of the foundation here in the room today. Now, I wanna talk for a second about our two guests. Our first guest, our honored guest is Zalman Lotik. A lot of you, you're here because you know who he is, but I'll tell you more. Zalman is an internationally recognized authority on Yiddish folk and theater music, as well as a leading figure in Jewish theater and concert worlds. For past 20 years, he's been the artistic director and conductor of the National Yiddish uh, Theater Folks Bina, and his incredible vision brought the critically acclaimed award-winning Fiddler Off and Dach, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, directed by Joel Gray, for which he served as music director to New York and will serve uh, yet as musical director for the international and national tours being planned for once our world gets back to normal. Um, I'll add that Zalman has a fascinating family and personal history as a really unique character in the world and someone I have looked up to for a long time. I've sung his arrangements and enjoyed his music. Um, and he's part of an incredible family that is truly unique in the world uh, that has given tremendous love to Yiddish music of all kinds. Of course, we're also joined with, uh, by Mati Lazar, Matthew Lazar, founder and director of the Zamir Choral Foundation, who has created this renaissance in Jewish choral music in North America that I know I've been so privileged to be a part of, as I said, my whole adult life. And even uh, back in high school was my first time singing with Mati. Uh, and a wonderful choir in and a wonderful concert in Chicago. Mati is the conductor of the Zamir Chorale, creator of the North American Jewish Choral Festival, Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, and Zamir Noded. He has conducted choral, choral orchestral Jewish themed concerts across the United States and Israel, conducted all the greatest cantors of this generation. Um, I'll say that um, I always like to remind Mati of this story, but when I was uh, a graduate student and I wasn't sure what direction I was going to take, if I was going to go on to PhD studies in philosophy or something, uh, or head to cantorial school. And I was really in a place uh, and I looked at Mati and I said, what should I do? And he said, this is the most obvious question anyone's ever asked. Just go to HUC and we'll talk later. Um, and so in many ways, I thank Mati uh, for pushing me into my cantorial career, which I think has worked out okay. Um, <laughs> we want to Welcome everyone who's with us today on Zoom. We know this incredible conversation will educate and inspire you from these two incredible Jewish leaders of Jewish music in our time. And I wanna kick it off right away by asking them uh, each to introduce themselves a little bit by means of talking about their upbringing, their musical education, their Jewish education. What brought you, Mati and Zalman? Uh, and you can fight it out over who gets to start. But what brought you to, to be this incredible person you are today? Tell us about your journey. Zelman? Well, thank you, Mati. First of all, I want to thank Mati and David and the Zamir Kroll Foundation for organizing this. I had the pleasure of uh, sitting in on Dr. Ruth's conversation last week, and it was just delightful. And being a longtime fan of Mati's and, uh, and the Choral Foundation. I'm honored to be a part of this um, afternoon. Um, my, you know, Beratius is always with your parents. Uh, and it's, it's, I have my parents to thank um, and to uh, look to when I think of my inspiration even today. My father was, um, survived the war by, by, by being one of the uh, Sugihara recipients and spent the war years in Shanghai. And my mother uh, was born here to, um, to uh, 
my grandparents uh, who were um, who were immigrants after you know the first immigration to America in the at the turn of the 19th uh, 20th century um, her first language was Yiddish my father's language was Yiddish so they they courted in Yiddish and uh, raised me in Yiddish um, my mother was a pianist and my mother was a, a, a became a, a, a folklorist and a, um, um, a uh, collector of Yiddish folk songs. And my father was a writer and um, became active in the workman's circle and uh, eventually producing, producing uh, concerts and theaters all over the United States for Yiddish. Um, this was the home. This was the home I grew up in. Um, it was uh, a vibrant home of the leading Yiddish song music professionals of the day, from Lazar Weiner to Sidor Belarski to Masha Benya, at the house all the time, uh, singing to the wee hours. And I, as a kid, took all that in. And it certainly uh, had a big, um, you know, influence on my, you know, on, on my future education, musical education. Um, I can continue. Shall I, can, shall I continue? Where, uh, where? Let me, let me jump in and tell please, you please. How, and tell everyone just how long it is that we've admired each other because <laughs> of our um, dedication to the music of our people and the excellence which is necessary to continue the, the music of our people. And I also have parents to whom I have to thank. Uh, there, it's a different life story. Uh, I was brought up by American born parents who were very proud of being American and very proud of being Jewish. They were modern Orthodox, whatever that meant in the 1950s. I think it meant mixed singing and mixed dancing primarily. They were very knowledgeable Jewishly. They were very sophisticated musically, especially uh, it, when it came to music. They were Hebrew speaking and they were big Zionists. And uh, my Shabbos experience with them pretty much tells the tale, which was that we, we'd sing Zmiras on Friday night, usually in harmony. My mother was a soprano, my father was a bass. My sister and I had to fill in the middle somehow, uh, but we succeeded in that. And then on Shabbos, we'd go to shul, usually to hear either Moshe Kosovitsky or David Kosovitsky with choir. And then when Shabbos was over, we would sit down at the piano after Havdalah, and my father would play, and my mother would sing Schubert, and then we would sing Gilbert and Sullivan. And then after that, we would watch Sit Caesar and your show of shows. That was the way in which my parents injected their Americanness and made sure that they met their challenge of allowing us, my sister Nina and me, to experience, uh, to experience Western culture and Western civilization with a Jewish lens. Our, our, what we have in common in that story, aside from parents committed parents, parents is the, is the Gilbert and Sullivan aspect. My, although we didn't sit, we, we, our Gilbert and Sullivan experience was, was, was reserved for Thanksgiving when we would get together with my mother's sister, Malka Gottlieb, and our Thanksgiving dinners were all about going through every, all the GNS scores that we could find and sing together. Who played, the, who was the accompanist for all of them? In the early years, my mother and my aunt, and then later years, I, I was playing. Yeah. I, I always think of uh, this Jewish lens on Western civilization when I think of Gilbert and Sullivan, especially uh, the end of Pinafore, where, uh, in spite of all temptations to belong to other nations, he remained an Englishman, he remained an Englishman. For he might have been a Russian, a Turk, a French, a Prussian, or perhaps Italian, or perhaps Italian. But in spite of all temptation to belong to other nation. And here my parents wouldn't say, he remains an Englishman. They'd look at me, Ke'ilu, to say, he remained a Jew. 
<laughs> because that was the challenge in those days. And when we did sing, he remained, he remained an Englishman, he remained an Englishman. It was the perfect dialectic of particularism and universalism. Here we were using this British uh, iconic music and text to express what the natural tendency is to feel for your own people. At the same time, I could feel what it was to be English because of the music. And at the same time, I had the awareness that whatever the circumstance, and they were proud Americans, and I am, you were, didn't have to give up your Jewishness to be that. Nice. My mother did a, um, a Purim um, spiel based on Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, where she took the famous, uh, you know, Men of me, kleine shit, Men of me, kleine put a shizzle, Zer shine put a shizzle, put a shizzle, as for Buttercup, um, and uh, other things. And I just, it was a whole poor medley that she put together that, w that the Workman Circle published in the late 70s. Yeah, I want to interject for a second. Because I think um, both of you were talking with me about um, the experience of sort of leaving the fold a little bit, um, either from you know the uh, the world you grew up in, Mati, um, in a sort of Orthodox community, and, and Zalman leaving the Yiddish community, and 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 finding your way towards a more formal classical education. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that existence of uh, carrying the culture from one side to the other both ways. I think that's something really interesting you two share. I think both of us were pushed, if that's the right word, we didn't feel pushed. It was a natural progression for us to be trained in classical music. Well, Zalman and I were pianists from a very, very early age. I remember in the first grade when they said they were teaching the letter H and I said to the teacher, there is no H because on the piano, the, you didn't get that far unless you were learning in German. Uh, where H is B natural and B really stands for B flat. But there was no breakaway. I was trained in classical music from the beginning. We, we, we sang Mozart. We, as I indicated, we, my parents played and sang Schubert. I remember being about six years old and telling my father, why are we listening to Mendelssohn? He's not as good as Bach. And uh, my father said, oh, you'll learn, you'll learn. My... Um my, yes, I also was, tr my mother, my, my aunt, who was my first piano teacher, um, you know, we, we were playing uh, Beethoven forehands, um, you know, f very often. And that was really how we would spend our time together um, after lessons, um, doing forehands and whether it was Schubert or, 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 or Beethoven. Um, it, I, I, would, I wouldn't say I was ever, you know, that I ever left my Yiddishist roots. I think my Yiddishist roots um, guided me. And, um, you know, as I, as I shared, you know, through many hours of, of therapy and, and uh, you know, deciding whether which course, if I, if I had to take a course, you know, if I, which pathway, um, I, 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 I tell the story that when I was studying with uh, Bernstein uh, uh, in Tanglewood um, in the late 70s, he had already, um, because of a mutual friend, Jack Gottlieb, um, Zechariah Lavracha, the composer, and I think you, many of you know his, his, some of his, his choral works. He was uh, Bernstein's editor and... Uh, uh, assistant for many years. Um, anyway, Jack and I befriended each other and uh, they got to know of my Yiddish the theatrical work in, 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 in those years. And um, I remember going to Bernstein after a concert and, and he, as he was asking me, what, what am I doing next, next year? And I was telling him, I'm going to Juilliard. And he said, what, why, wh why does the world need another Verdi conductor when you know your music so well? And uh, that hit me. That hit me hard. And uh, it, it, in the Kishka, as they say, and I, and I took, it took me a long time to understand that 
yes, um, I have a, perhaps I, perhaps I have a mission here, you know, perhaps there was a mission for me in, you know, wanting to pre present music in the, in the, in the ways that I would hear Beethoven and, and Verdi, but wanting to make sure that, that Yiddish music was able to be transmitted in that way and be heard uh, with, this, with the same ears, so to speak. Um, I, w I wanted, you reminded me when uh, you said about playing the forehands that on, at the occasions that you, Zalman, have uh, uh, consented to accompany Hazamir, especially at the annual gathering of remembrance, I turned to Vivian, I said, that's how Beethoven would play it. <laughs> uh, and Vivian said, no, when Zalman plays, he can play forehands just by himself. <laughs> Thank you. So that's a, well, it's true. You have a, a fantastic way of playing the piano. And as a pianist, I appreciate Thank your you. ability to use all 88 of those wonderful ivory keys and ebony keys. Thank uh, but you reminded me in your story about Bernstein and, and the time that I was preparing a Cotter Symphony for Bernstein in 1975. And all the times I was preparing um, music and, uh, and Beethoven's Ninth for Zubin Mehta, in those private conversations, they always said pretty much the same thing. Conduct, are you conducting the music that you cannot live without? Mm. Pay attention to what gives you, uh, this is from a different kind of uh, uh, psychological field, what brings you joy. But what is it that really centers you was their idea. And it's a wisdom, I think, that people at the top of their field can look at you and and ask that question because obviously they're conducting the music that touches them. Which brings me to a question uh, that we sometimes discuss, which is in choral music, we're dealing with text and music. And there's the tune and there's the harmony. And I know you well enough that one of the common points we have is the harmony is everything. Because it's the harmony that's illuminating our emotional feelings, it gives us comfort, it allows us escape, it gives catharsis, it can be inspiring and it can show defiance. When you're singing uh, or playing or doing both or conducting or just listening, what is it about the music and the music and the text that brings you the joy, that brings you to that point where you can gain an, gain an awareness and find some kind of epiphany? You know, the 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 text is always the key, you know, I mean, the, when, when we, whenever I work with a singer, with a new singer, whether it was training, you know, singers for the recent Fiddler production or any production that I, I'm working as, with, it's always about them understand, having, making sure that the text is in their kishkas, that they know exactly what they're saying. Um, that 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 pretty much guides my my arrangements. Um, you know, when I many much of the Yiddish theater repertoire, you know, we found <clears throat> people found before me, the collectors Ansky and Ruth Rubin and many others found it and and published it with just simple um, melody lines. No harmony, no anything. And one absolutely can um, make the case that much of these folk songs were meant to be sung just as simple melodies. But when we bring that music to a, to a, a population that is so uh, influenced by so much Western music that is harmonized. Um, I feel it, it is my and our responsibility to present that music as well in, in with, with developed harmonies as well. So in terms of folk songs, theater songs are simil similar. I was mentioning that many of the theater songs that were published at the turn of the century were published with very, very simple piano accompaniments, purely because they wanted to get the music out to the public. The Yiddish theater was going, you know, 20, 30 shows a week with many, 
many different musicals going on and they were publishing this music and people were buying it for the, so that they could play it. So the accompaniments have very little to do with the actual harmony. So, but when I look at it, I really look at it and say, okay, well, what, how, 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 how would harmony really serve this text and make it that much more effective? And that's, that's I feel, is a lot of my work as I, as I prepare music um, for, you know, Yiddish music to, and bring it to public today. That, I find that same difficulty, of course, uh, when you're trying to elevate the, uh, the harmonies so they're not just two or three or four <laughs> chord uh, arrangements, without uh, going over the line uh, into, as you would say in Yiddish, an ungepashka arrangement. And it's not only the text I find that I have to pay attention to, but the original musical style and how difficult that is for arrangers, which is a lower level difficulty than trying to create uh, from nothing the actual music as a composer does. And when I was arranging the, uh, the, the tunes that Elie Wiesel, Zichon Oliver Acha, had taught me from his visionist background, that was always the subject of the conversation. Uh, Ellie was, a, was a, com a conductor of a girls' choir after the war in Paris, and he had a good sense of harmony. Um, and he would uh, look at me and say, um, that's right? Or, you know, don't be afraid. We could use a little more harmony there. Mm -hmm. Or, I, I think, I think it, you've gone over the line uh, because it's a fealty to the original source that's so important. But it's so, it's so, such a delicate uh, operation. I was, I was present at that concert and I sat on the tip of my chair uh, with excitement of how deftly you um, accompanied and brought his uh, music to life. It was, uh, it was one of those, I know, I know that it's recorded, I have not seen the recording, but I just remember that event so well because it was one of those very, very special moments where you were, you, you, you didn't get in the way at all, but, but, but on, the, on the contrary, you, you um, supported and, uh, and, 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 and highlighted as you're, as you're just describing those harmonic uh, moments. But it's, uh, as, it, as I say, it's, it's a very delicate process. Thank you very much. And I remember your being there and how happy I was to have seen you there because I knew you could appreciate all the aspects of that, of that evening. Yeah. Uh, and I'm thinking, as you say, not getting, out of the, not getting in the way, how much that's the job of the conductor. People don't really understand that job of the conductor to achieve a kind of a balance. That's one of the reasons we admire each other is that we have a high degree of sensitivity to balance within the orchestra, within the choir, within our fingers when we're playing the piano, uh, thinking about how Schumann was so angry at his left fourth finger that he destroyed it. But how is it that, how... Tell, tell me, them how that, tell them, how, tell them about that contraption that he... Schumann, whose wife was the greatest pianist of the time, um, Clara Schumann, who was a friend and patron, uh, not a financial patron, but a musical patron of Johannes Brahms, who was, who was in love with her. Uh, and Clara Schumann saw her husband, Robert Schumann, devise a contraption that was connected to the ceiling and connected to his fourth finger that had some kind of it's too bad he, he wasn't, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a, an inventor, we know that, because that finger went away and really atrophied in a, terrible, in a terrible way. He was perfect the way he was. I have no idea what motivated him to go in that direction. Uh, but I want to go, <laughs> thanks for that. I want to go back to how you feel, What's, what ego state are you achieving or are you accessing when you're in the middle of it you're directing it, but at the same time, you're watching it and just kind of, I don't want to say driving the car, but you're, you're, you're not playing unless you are playing, but when you're conducting. I, I, that was my, I, I had that, I, I was fortunate to have that experience for the last year and a half with Fiddler, um, conducting Fiddler, you know, 
people people um, often asked me if I tired of conducting it seven times a week. And um, I said, I never tired of it. Number one, because the score is such a genius score, you know, put together from the lyrics to the music to the way the theatricality of the songs enter and, and how they advance the, 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 the themes of, of the piece. But, but musically, I never tired because I was, I was uh, as I, I'm conducting, I was watching uh, the, the monitor. I had a monitor. I was in the back of the stage, so I, they were, I wasn't in front, I was in the back. So my contact was with the, with the singers was through two video cameras, uh, two, two television cameras that, uh, that were in the auditorium, in the theater. So when they looked out um, through their periphery vision, they could see me conducting. But um, whether they looked or not is a question, and that's, that's a whole other subject. But, 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 my, but, but speaking from, from my vantage point, I uh, really was hearing from, from, uh, you know, from acoustically what I was hearing and also hearing from the, from the monitor. And um, it was a very, very, uh, very special for me um, this that, that that particular experience because of how committed the actors and singers were um, every moment around you know it it was never a case where they uh, the phrases um, called it in they never you know they never wired in a performance you know it they were always very very much present and present in terms of how they how they um, expressed the, the the text that was always an it was always a sense of honesty and and of course I would give notes at the end if there were notes to be given most mostly Yiddish notes throughout the time you know just to brush up the Yiddish but uh, I want to interject for a second since I want to bring us to our, our specific topic of music and challenging time um, you know I think both of you over the course of your careers have really done amazing efforts to bring out music of Jewish people throughout some of our hardest times, right? And to bring back some of the music that has comforted Jewish community throughout all of our difficult times in our history. Um, so if you were to think about in that music, what is it that gives us strength from that music and how can we access that now when we're looking for support for uplift in music and maybe especially because we have two or greater at greatest experts on jewish music <laughs> um where do we go to get that uplift in jewish music now having spent your careers giving that to people um you've given it to us in person and now we have to we have to get it a different way so wh where should we go and and how do we how do we find it well in in you know in 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 at previous moments in, in history, um, people have always adapted, they've taken comfort from familiar melodies. So, so um, we know of the, um, of the example of, of Rajingis and Mandlin, um, in them base amigdo shinavi in kocheda, the old Goldfaden tune. We know that that um, that they wrote a version of that when they talked about the Sabotka Yeshiva and the uh, the tragedy that happened um, in in many of the uh, in Vilna and around Vilna. And there was com there was comfort to be taken by hearing an old melody. Um, in the in the in the Holocaust years, they took Eifim Pripachik um, and um, changed the words "Bam Getov, Bam Getov, Toyero, Brent, Afayero" by the gate of the ghetto. And while the text is uh, difficult, uh, there is something about the melody that brings comfort. And um, you know, when you look at some of these parodies that are going around online these days, um, you know, you know, 
all kinds of parodies that are de dealing with the the, the present. Um, we we take we 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 are we we are somewhat relieved. We 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 smile. We we uh, appreciate the creativity that's being that that's being being done using popular melodies, and I think that that is a. Uh, that that is a that that is a strong part of of the of the whole, whole human experience that we we don't we're, we're not stopping being creative our 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 resources are 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 being are, are limited now but um many of us can tell you that we're working harder now than we work we were working before just kind of trying to find ways to pre present uh, different kinds of music to in different ways, so so um, I think you know we're 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 f we're taking what we have and and going with it. Now the comfort that you're talking about uh, in in a Russian kiss uh, with a, the terrible uh, evocation of the extermination place called the Ninth Fort, uh, and your other example is. Uh, those are the dramatic moments. Uh, uh, although for shul-going uh, Jews, they love the old tunes, and it's those tunes that give them the comfort. And however badly they might be sung, uh, sometimes people don't necessarily hear the performance, um, but really are just connecting in a very emotional way to their memory when, when you hear a piece of music that you heard with your father, as I do with my father, I can hear, I can still, I can still feel my father's hand on mine if I, if I allow myself to go back in time and don't try to overthink it and just try to feel the places that, that the music can bring me to. But in answer to your question, David, there are so many ways in which the music can help us. And I think uh, besides the familiarity of the tunes that we know, uh, the internet and Alexa and everybody has almost every piece of music ever written with a thousand different performances on it. And Beethoven can give you comfort, Mozart can give you comfort, uh, Bach can surely give you comfort, the music of your childhood. Dr. Ruth uh, last week gave us all an assignment that we should create our own music of our, life, of our lives. These are the ways in which the music, and we should talk about that a little bit. What is it about the music in a, in a physiological way that can bring us to tears or bring us to a smile or bring us to a place where we're not a suffering at the moment? Uh, and I think that that's really the answer, David. It's a little bit of both. It's what we know that gives us comfort uh, and it's the melodies, sometimes it's the harmony and Here's an assignment, listen to The Moldau by Smetna and compare your feelings when you hear Hatikva in major. What does that do for you? Hmm. The Jewish people are unique in that their national anthem is in minor, which even if you're not a serious musician or musicologist, you instinctively know what that means. It's a different kind of experience. And, you know, Zalman, I, I never asked you this before, but I'm always faced with the temptation at the end of a piece that's in minor, in the very last chord, I have a life and death struggle. With, <laughs> am I going to put a major third? Or pick, am I going to give a pickety third at the end or not? Uh, sometimes people do it with Hatikva, which is a little presumptuous. However, uh, what I learned when I was a little younger uh, from Paul Maynard, a great uh, harpsichordist with the New York Musica. He said, you know, that major third, that Picardy third is not a happy ending. When Bach does it, it can be redemption, but often it's just a smile of what might have been. Ah, that's nice. Yeah. Zalman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, Zalman Matsi, I'm going to start um, peppering in some of the questions from people in our chat room um, as, we, as we start uh, hearing, hearing more interesting parts of your story. Um, Zalman, one question, the first question that anybody asked was, um, if anyone wants to gain access to any of the Yiddish translations that were used in your Fiddler, if that's ever going to be something the world will be able to have available. So that's just, yes, that's just a, an easy question. You can tell us how we can, um, how we can access that. If at, the can. Mo at the moment, the way to get that is through um, purchasing the Yiddish, the CD. 
um, we're, we're not at liberty to just send it out. So if you, if you purchase the CD, then you get a link to all of the lyrics. Awesome. And Perfect. That's how to do it. Now, the next question was a specific Yiddish question, but I think it relates to some of our Hebrew things too, which is, um, you know, both Yiddish and Hebrew, a lot of us grew up with different kinds of pronunciation systems. And then we find, uh, we find in music, uh, words are just published in a different way than maybe we know them. Um, so it's, it's a curiosity when we're thinking about how we're going to perform things and how we're going to sing things and represent Yiddish and Hebrew. And, and Frank, I think this is as true for Hebrew, frankly. Um, where do you come down on, on sort of honoring the memory of how we think a word used to sound uh, versus maybe uh, fealty to some more modern conceptions of, of pronunciation in those languages? When it comes to Hebrew, and there's this big discussion, especially since the creation of the state, where Ashkenazic pronunciation was kind of frowned upon, and uh, Sephardic was, uh, pronunciation was idealized uh, up to the point where people can't tell the difference between an aw and an ah, a patach and a kamatz, although I'm sure the Levites and the Beit HaMikdash could sure tell the difference between those two. Uh, but performance practice is the way that I was brought up in my classical training. If it was written with a certain pronunciation, do your best. Uh, try to get that right. It could be that uh, you face a blowback against it, which I have in the past, but it's very hard to do Lewandowski, for example, uh, if you're not willing to engage in the pronunciation. And very often, it, it even comes down to where the word stress is. For example, the tune Eliyahu Hanavi, we think of it as Elia, accent on the first beat, Eliyahu Hanavi, even though musically speaking it should be 3-1, Eliyahu Hanavi, which is more aesthetically correct, but if you do it that way it loses the urgency of the bakasha, of the bakasha, of what you're trying to get God to do for you, and that means that there's no rhythm there, just Give it to me now. I need it now. Mm -hmm. Zalman, what's your take on, on different well, ways of saying Yiddish? You know, the, as we know, that you know, there's there's you know, there are many different dialects of Yiddish. You know, um, one of the things that you know we always face is, well, that's not the Yiddish I heard, and or that's not that doesn't sound like the way I heard it. And um, you know, my father who. Uh, came from a little little town out of Warsaw, spoke with a, a, a true Vashava Yiddish, which <clears throat> would, would, have, would have said, um, instead of flesh mit beina, meat uh, with bones, he would say flesh mit beina. Um, you know, but when he spoke to me, when he taught me Yiddish, he spoke, he said flesh mit beina because that's the, the literary way of, of how it's spelled and how, um, how that was the, the accepted way. Um, often often when, when, uh, when I do Yiddish theater songs, I do them with a dialect called the Volina accent, which is a, the typical accent that, um, dialect that was used for the Yiddish theater. Um, so instead of, the word un, we would say in, and uh, things like that. But, but in many cases, you have to be uh, cognizant of the, of what the, uh, always to what the, how, how the, how the pronunciation may affect the meaning of the word. Um, there are cases, Gebirtig, Marche Gebirtig, of course, you know, uh, the composer of many popular Yiddish uh, songs, um, his, the way he would have pronounced Baina would be Baina. And you have to honor that in the rhyme scheme when you sing, when you sing his songs. And so. I think so many times with, with especially songs that we kind of remember and we're enjoying a performance and all of a sudden we hear a pronunciation that feels wrong and it can just take your head right out of the joy of the music. Mm -hmm. So there's something, it's such a delicate balance. Um, there's some interesting questions. I'm going to combine a few into one. Uh, I think it's, uh, which is especially for both of you as, as conductors and then imagining us 
uh, us as singers and performers. This is a time when, you know, your craft of conducting is, is largely unavailable uh, since we can't be together. Uh, so there's a question for you about what's giving you the sort of satisfaction that you would ordinarily gain from working with an ensemble. Those of us as singers and one voice alone is, is great, um, but I know for myself, uh, you know, I, I, I'm living in a household with a husband who is a wonderful rabbi and a terrible singer. Um, so the joys of making harmony is something that I can't have right now and I miss it dearly. So love to hear from you two as conductors about where you are with your craft and how missing that feels for you and what you can offer to us as some comfort for the craft that we're missing of being able to sing in harmony with each other. There, I think there are two parts to that question. Uh, I know that Zalman and I agree that part of the joy of conducting is the interaction with the singers or with the players. That's what really gives us the human connection. Yes, we spend time learning the scores. Yes, we spend time preparing the scores and preparing for rehearsals. And we are not in it for the social component, although the social interaction is what brings us joy, especially when people are looking at you and giving you their souls and you are giving them your souls and no one is waiting for the other to move forward first. That's the natural uh, uh, tra uh, transaction that everyone expects. But there's the other half, which at least for me, if I'm not uh, conducting live people and I try to over Zoom, which of course has not evolved to the point where it can, it can be very funny when people try to sing on Zoom, but to, to the extent that I have rehearsals with the Zamir Corral or Zamir No Dead, we're muting, I'm playing, they're singing, and then either a soprano or, or one part will sing, and at the end we unmute and laugh hysterically for a while. But it gives me an opportunity to look at the scores and to, you know, conductors like to say, in answer to the question, what was the best performance you ever had of that piece? And the answer is, when I read the score alone, because everyone was on time, the balances were perfect, the climax is where it should have been, the tempo was perfect. And of course, if you have a piano, and both Zalman and I have pianos, you can revisit old pieces that used to be in your fingers, or look through new music. And that's I th those are the two things I think that answer your question there, David, for me at least. Yeah. I mean, for me, for me what, 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 what's going on is I'm preparing these concerts that I'm doing through the Folksbina website. Part of our outreach at this time is to create these uh, parlor living room concerts that I'm doing from my piano. And basically I'm looking at material that um, songs from the Yiddish theater, from Yiddish folk songs that have always touched me, that I've always loved. And what I find is I'm teaching them online and I'm, and I'm singing with them and I'm, I'm singing them. And it gives me a tremendous joy to know that there are people who are enjoying hearing, hearing that, those, those songs. Um, sometimes for myself, I'll, I'll pull out an old, you know, vol first volume of Beethoven sonatas that I used to play to try to see what's still in my fingers. So I start to do that a little bit, but, uh, I'm, the, 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 I'm, I'm playing a lot more for myself and for, and for, for the public in, 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 in the odd way through, through online concerts. So it's, I'm enjoying that a lot. You know, we have um, literally about just a few more minutes to be able to talk before we uh, transition to our next thing. So I'm going to add, here's, a, here's a, the shortest question I can think of to ask is um, for those of us who are lovers of Jewish choral music, Hebrew, Yiddish, whatever language it's in, uh, and looking for the greatest inspiration you can offer us right now, um, what should we listen to? over the next, over this next time? When should we, when we get off this call, what should we put on uh, to give ourselves tremendous spiritual uplift now? I would say first, listen to your inner voice. Trust yourself, meditate for three minutes, just breathe in and out and see what comes to you. And chances are you'll know what it is that is the kind of music 
whether it's the Beatles, um, you know, giving a, a personal preference there, or Beethoven, or or any kind of music, anything in between. Trust yourself. You know, people know more about it than, than they think they do. Uh, people like to get instruction, but the fact is that everyone is knows themselves best and no judgments. Just right. listen to the music that makes you happy and, and gives you comfort. Yeah, I would have to, I would say the same. I say, you know, think about the music that you listen to all your life. You know, the different, the different, you know, you, most of us love many different styles of music. You know, it, one can't, you know, I can't say I prefer this or to that, but many of us just have love to listen to so many different styles. Think of those styles, I would say, you know, and, and go to them and, you know, put them on and see, and just re remind yourself of these old friends that you have that made you happy once. If you had, if you needed an assignment, that's, that's great advice, Alman. If you needed some structure, maybe a Yom Rishon Sunday could be a day for classical music. Mm. Uh, Monday could be a day for, uh, for Yiddish music. Tuesday could be a day for Israeli music. The next day could be for rock and roll and inhabit that musical style for a day and see what that uh, feels like to you and maybe even write a little bit of a journal and see what wisdom comes to you from inhabiting those musical styles and what part of your life that really stimulates your brain to meditate upon. It's sort of Machi's, Machi's musical Omer. Every day a new, another wow. style, I love it. We'll get to 49 styles before you know it. <laughs> uh, and then we'll have Shavuos and we'll go all night. Uh, well, it's- you, may, you mentioned Counting Omer, I have to tell you this memory of my childhood. Uh, to show what American and Jewish consciousness could be. When we were counting Omer back in, in, in grade school in Yeshiva in Borough Park, of course, halachically, you're not supposed to say what last night was by saying the, the number. So we would say the name of the ball player who had that number on his back. So, for example, even though I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, Today, if someone asked me about what the count was, I'd say Willie Mays, because last night, even though he was a Giants player, he was such a great ball player, but everyone would go, oh, sure, sure, I get it, I get it. <laughs> right. um, well, I want to, uh, on behalf of the Zamira Coral Foundation, uh, thank you, both of you, Mati and Zalman, for, for inspiring us today with uh, your history and your futures and, and the great music making of your of your whole careers and your lives that we're looking forward to being able to be back together soon and and be able to make great music in in public together um, and especially for talking about how we can get through these challenging times and this conversation about music in challenging times special 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 thanks to you Zalman Mati we know you support Zamir a lot Zalman uh, we're, we're so grateful for you, to you for joining us now these are rough times for everyone for all of us in all of our different organizations and all our different lives and I want to take this time to urge you to remember that the Zamir Coral Foundation itself plays a really unique role in our Jewish world there is no other organization like it that sustains and develops and nurtures Jewish identity, love for Israel, for the Jewish people across all generations and denominations, all different political perspectives. One of Mati's favorite phrases to say, I know, is I don't care who you vote for, I care if you're a soprano, alto, alto tenor, or bass. And, and that's real for us in this community. From Haza Prep, to Hazamir, to Zamir No Dead, to the Zamir Chorale, to the North American Jewish Choral Festival, and all the many activities of the Zamir Choral Foundation. It is this foundation that plays a role that simply no other organization in Jewish life is fulfilling today. And in order for us to keep doing that work, we need you. We rely on you. We can't sing a solo by ourselves. We need a great ensemble. So we're excited to say that uh, a few anonymous donors have together contributed $50,000 as a matching grant for which every dollar given will be matched one-to-one. -one. We are already now 25% towards that goal. 
So there's uh, a link on the, in the chat, uh, or there's instructions on the screen where you can text and you can make a contribution to the Zamir Coral Foundation. Uh, if you have trouble accessing the chat, you just click right in the bottom of your screen. There should be a little thing that says chat and you can see the messages there and be able to uh, click on that link. Um, it makes a big difference for the foundation, for all of us. God willing, we'll be able to be back together in person soon, making music, uh, making music in all the ways that we've all studied and trained and learned for our whole lives. And when we do that, we, we need to be ready for it. So I really want to thank all of you for participating and joining in today for the questions you asked. I know I didn't get to ask every single one uh, to Mati and Zalman, but luckily Mati and Zalman are amazing people. And if you probably push them, I bet you you could get an answer from them some other way. Um, I want to especially thank you, Mati and Zalman, for, for just opening yourselves up, your spirits, your, your past, your present, your future. It meant a lot to me and to a lot of other people here. I want to wish everyone a great afternoon. Enjoy this beautiful in Chicago. It's sunny and gorgeous today. I hope I've heard good things about the weather elsewhere. Take in the air in a challenging time. It's an incredible thing to experience God's goodness also. I want to say Shehechianu for being able to be here together with all of us. Baruch Atadonai, Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Shehechianu Vikiyamanu Vihigianu Lazman Hazeh. Thank you, God for helping us, for sustaining us, for allowing us to reach this beautiful day together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Zalman. Thank you, Marty. Thank you.